conceptual Jay sounded better than Jay Prince. People talk Real about talk, it. I ain't throwing shots. All of the elements. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick Wallace here. Uh, hoping that you're getting yourself off to a good start for this week uh, as you plan and move towards whatever it is you are uh, believing will be your outcome or desiring uh, as an outcome for each day, for each uh, week. Uh, I break mine down uh, as often as possible into literally seconds. Uh, but definitely minutes and hours I look to make as much of my day uh, productive in whatever capacity I deem necessary at any given time. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Uh, when you, uh, I believe it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's Les, Les, Les Alexander that says that when you behave and, and, and think and behave casually, you end up being a casualty. Uh, and I believe that I believe that the more casual, uh, casually we engage the opportunities presented to us by the time that we have in front of us is that that, that casual mindset produces too much. Uh, what's, what, how can I explain this? When you think casually, you open up yourself to the influences uh, that are moving forcefully in your life. You have to be aware of what's going on. You have to be focused and intent on achieving a specific and a specified goal. You have to have an understanding of how uh, you plan on engaging this at some particular point. First, there's the commitment, then there's the development of the strategy. But first, the commitment does come first. But anyway, so I'm just hoping that you are actually a person who is setting their intent. The power of intent cannot be over uh, emphasized uh, here. Uh, as you set your intent, you set the direction, you set the momentum, you set the energy, you, ex you set the anticipation and expectation of what takes place. So much of that has a massive impact on what you're able to accomplish over time. And with that being said, I wanna sort of switch gears uh, real quickly here about something that I am immensely passionate about. Uh, it's something that we deal with year-round, but it, it, it intensifies and it becomes more prevalent uh, during, during this time of the year, and that's mental health, mental illness, uh, especially in the areas of depression. Um, and I'm saying this because it's not only affecting adults in our community, it's also impacting uh, minors. Uh, last week, uh, it was brought to my attention that a young 10 year old girl who was being bullied in school, uh, harmed herself. Uh, this morning it is brought to my attention that here in Houston, in the Houston area, uh, place called Paraland, uh, Paraland, uh, uh, two Paraland students attempted suicide once one was successful, one was not. So again, we have minors who are dealing with issues, um, and for whatever reason, um, suicidal ideations appear. Uh, it seems to be the most expeditious way to deal with pain that seems unimaginable. Um, this is a season where depression is at its peak for all different types of reasons, which I won't get into here. Uh, and we live in a society where people want to pretend that everything is okay, that admitting that there's something wrong or that we need help is frowned upon. The idea that you could possibly be depressed carries a stigma to it. And so you sit up and you tell yourself, you're okay. We live in a world where we're told, just suck it up, be tough. And, 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 and that we're viewed as weaklings when we say we need help. And we tend to also easily engage the world around us as if everyone is seeing life through the lens in which we're viewing it. So if everything is okay for us, we tend to talk about things, carry on with things, mention things and do things that reflects where we are 
but without giving consideration to what someone else might be. We tend to get lost in ourselves. We are highly egocentric in many ways, and it's that, that, that egocentricity is facilitated by a culture that drives us to think about ourselves. I want to encourage you, before I talk about what I'm going to talk about, which I'm going to do briefly, I want to encourage you to be careful about how you carry yourself, to be alert and aware of what's going on with the people around you. Some people are suffering in silence very close to you, and you probably are not aware of it, or you're probably just thinking they'll be okay. You, 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 let, let me explain something to you. It doesn't take a whole lot when there's no support system around you, when you are trying to handle everything on your own. I don't care how tough you are. I don't care how much you've been through. It doesn't take a whole lot for your thoughts to start spiraling out of control in a downward pattern. And that if there's no one there to rescue you, and I don't mean in any drastic or emphatic sense, sometimes just sitting up and telling a person, hey man, how are you doing? I was just thinking about you. If you ever need me, call me, and following up on that. Uh, paying attention to signs and flags uh, of someone who is depressed. You know, things that they normally are excited about, they're not excited about. Uh, they're not as engaging as they usually are. They're not as upbeat as they usually are. They're not as uh, uh, talkative as they usually are. Look for changes in behavior in any type of way and take that as a sign. Nothing is inconsequential. Nothing happens without cause. People just don't sit up and change for no reason. And it's up to us to care about the people in our periphery enough to sit up and say, okay, this is not me pointing the blame at anybody for what's happened to these kids. This is me saying we've got to be better prepared. I think that we live in a society that we just flow with things too easily without really truly in examining and investigating what's happening. And these babies are literally giving up before they ever get started. That's Those are dreams that won't ever be fulfilled uh, because they ran into something they didn't know how to handle. And we all do. That's why we are social beings. That's why we are designed to function in a social group because individually there are things in life you're going to face. I don't care how tough you are. You're going to face it and it's going to be bigger than you. How you get through it is by what you expect from the world around you. And yes, there's a point in place where you get to where absolutely everything comes at you, you know how to manage it. But I can tell you there's absolutely nobody, including myself, that does not have moments. How quickly you rescue yourself from that moment will determine how much that moment influences you. And everybody isn't equipped to rescue themselves uh, immediately from a, an emotional downturn. Anything can trigger it. It's so many different things. And then when you've got such easy and indirect ways to bully people now, it's easy for people to come at you, attack you, and then magnify it by sharing it with thousands and thousands upon thousands of people in a matter of minutes, which magnifies the embarrassment, magnifies the hurt, magnifies the struggle, the hardship, the disappointment. And then there you are with not knowing how to manage this, who to talk to, what can you talk to someone about? And all of these things, and I was talking to my wife about this the other day when the little girl, we found out the little girl hung herself. She's 10 years old, she gets bullied. And then the bully shares the video of them bullying her physically and she doesn't know how to cope with it. And we're going like, well, could she talk to her parents? We don't know the story and we don't wanna place blame. That's not what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do is say, we've got a responsibility as a community, as, as, as a people, as, I mean, and on every level that we exist, we have a responsibility to our youth. You can't escape that. Whether you're looking at yourself as a collective, as a race, you're looking at yourself as a collective, as a class, if you're looking at yourself as a collective, as a group of, religious practitioners, no matter where you classify yourself, there's a responsibility to our youth. We have a responsibility as progenitors to protect those that we create. And and, and, and this is something that really bothers me is that, and, and, and please don't, 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 don't mistake this. 
I'm not sitting up dismissing the suffering and the struggle of adults. That's happening on a massive level. Number one is Christmas is the time that all the pretentious people come out and talk about everything that's going right in their life without ever admitting that they're struggling. So you got now a platform, a no, numerous platforms in which people can come talk about and pretend that their life is great and nothing ever goes wrong with it while people are really going through difficult hardship and, 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 and times. And because there's no transparency in, in, in what you're going through, you get to present your life in the way you want to present it. But there are people that are literally judging their lives based on how you're presenting yours. There's a responsibility in the way you present yourself. I tell people all the time, one of the reasons I mentioned 2012 being the hardest part of my life is because a lot of people, if they're around me, will tell you, it doesn't seem like things bother me. They bother me. I've just learned how to manage them over time. I've learned how to tap into certain resources. I've learned how to process what I'm looking at. But that takes lots and lots and lots of time, experiences, and hardships. I've been kicked around. I've gone through everything and emotion that anyone else is going around. And so what I want you to know is where you're at is not where you're going to stay at. Life is dynamic. Life is something that's happening. And it's moving. If we go back and we study history, that's a cyclical process where history repeats itself in almost every category. And so life is continuously moving. What does that mean? That means there are going to be some times in your life where you're up, you're flying, you're on cloud nine. There are going to be some times where you look up and it feels like everything in the world is moving against you. It's going to happen to you no matter who you are. That's just how life is. Something my grandfather shared with me in my teenage years that really set the standard of how I engage life. He said, son, I'm about to share something with you. You've probably heard me say this before. He, he, he says, if you get what I'm about to share with you, 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 you are going to be ahead of the game. As a matter of fact, if you can get what I'm giving you today, in addition to everything else I gave you, if you get what I give you today, you won't have to chase greatness. Greatness will overtake you. He says, in this life, you're going to be in one of three places. You're going to either be going into a storm, in a storm, or coming out of a storm. Get used to that. It's nothing wrong with it. We train ourselves in this world to run from struggle, run from heartache, run from pain, when it's actually that to condition us. We, we, we develop our, our capacity intellectually, but we train our emotions through, through, through actions and experience. And a strengthened emotional system is going to be able to survive things and grow from it regardless of where you at as far as capacity is concerned. And so I learned that, you know, that's that. He says, the one thing that I need you to do is when you're in the storm, focus on your number one responsibility, which is to make sure you come out a better man than when you went in, because that's the purpose of the storm. Well, you have to train yourself for that. There's a lot of people that are out there looking at people's lives on social media and thinking that their lives are so great while their lives suck. Then they're looking at everything that's going through and people are not really truly concerned with one another. Everybody's so busy about presenting a life that other people can look at and go, ooh, about that you don't understand that the most powerful impact you have on the world around you is how you pour into others, how you reach out to others, how you care about others, how you let someone know that they're not alone. He told me, my grandfather told me, son, feel your space. Never walk into a situation and leave people the way you found them. And that's basically what he meant by that. Always try to leave people in a better situation. Always leave them encouraged. Always leave them with hope. Always leave them with an expectation of something better. Because when you've got hope, you'll survive anything to, until you find the strategies, the, the ways out, the coping mechanisms. Just knowing that it, it will get better is what people need. you got too many people living in a dark place that they don't see a way out of. And that's not even why I came on, but I had to talk about that because to wake up to that news that another kid has killed themselves and another one with them attempted it and, and, and didn't succeed in the same school is, is, is crazy. And, and we used to be able to pretend that it didn't affect the black community. And I'm speaking specifically us to what I can tell you is it impacts the black community in a way that no one wants to admit emphatically, especially when it comes to our women. And we've got to be aware of this. We've got to be aware of the signs. We've got to be aware of the symptoms. We've got to be aware of how we can reach out to people. Um, I'm not going to get into the depths of, of the way I feel about a lot of the ways we attempt to reach out to people who are really hurting. Uh, 
I think that we use escape mechanisms or easy, uh, easily applied mechanisms like, I'm going to pray for you. Uh, and it's been done so often and it carries such little weight now that that means absolutely nothing to the average person. What people want to know is that you care. What people want to know is that it's going to be better. What people want to know is if I don't know how to help you, I'm going to help you find someone who does. You're not going through this alone. What can I do? Give them some options. The moment that a person has options, it immediately gets better. It's because I'm going to tell you something. Nobody takes their lives with options. It's when they look at leaving this place as the only option uh, uh, capable of relieving the pain that they're feeling at that given moment. They see nothing but what they're in and no way out. You have the ability, no matter who you are, to reach into somebody's life and say, you know what? It will get better. You know what? When I went through this, that was this moment. When I went through that, that was this moment. When I did this, that was this moment. Your life is your greatest testimony and powerful influence into what somebody's going through. Show them where you've been. Show them what you come out of. It's okay to talk about what you have now, what you've accomplished now, but let them know the story behind the glory because the story behind the glory is more powerful than what you've received or where you're living at. How you came from this when everybody wrote you off. How you came through this when you went through a divorce. How you came through this when you lost your mother, your father, or a child. How you came through all of these things that you were able to survive. Each one of you has fought through something in life. The book of uh, Lamentations, Jeremiah says, these things I call to mind, or uh, these things I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. So I go back and I visit. Man, when it was like this, I didn't think I could get out, but I made it. Now, if I can find a way to communicate that to somebody else who's in a place where they don't believe they can make it, and I show them that it doesn't get too dark to come out of, and I give them multiple options to what's possible. I don't have to have the answer. I just have to let them know that there is one. That's the wonderful thing about it. We get so afraid we want to back up. And you can't cover the pain that some people are going through without praying for you because they can't relate. There are some places you can go if you really want to admit it. I don't care what religion you're in. I don't care what faith system you function in. You, If you're going to be honest with yourself, you're going to have to admit at least one time in your life you got to a place where you were disconnected from, from the Almighty, that you couldn't see how, they, that, how he cared for you. You couldn't really grasp how that was a purpose in this life for you with what you were going through. If you are honest with yourself, you're going to have to admit that was a place that somebody telling you, I'm going to pray for you, you wasn't going to do much because you weren't feeling God right then because God wasn't, in your mind, God wasn't feeling. You've got to be able to reach out of a place outside of judgment, outside of casting somebody down, outside of trying to treat them like you're where you're at because your faith isn't where it needs to be. All these things we like to do when we put ourselves on pedestals and just simply reach out there and say, you know what? <clears throat> I've been there. It hurts. And it doesn't look like there's anything you can do about it. But what I tell you, if you hold on, if you just hold on, life is cyclical. A good time is coming, I promise you. If you just sit back and look at it, a good time is coming. Get them to talking about some things they went through and they survived. Get them to reminding themselves that they are an overcomer, that they have the ability to uh, 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 conquer any moment that they're in. Your responsibility is to be there. Not to pass them off with a I'll pray for you or I got you lifted. I'm sending, I'm sending love and light. Whatever it is that you practice, you need to send that. You, if you practice prayer, you need to pray. If you send love and light and energy, you need to do that. But you've also got to be engaged physically in helping people get through. Matter of fact, and then I'm going to move on. As a matter of fact, one of the most powerful forces behind advancing in life is helping other people engage their struggles and get through it. It's, it, it, it's not always receiving, it's, it's what you're pouring out. 
It's the energy you're putting into something. It's it, it, it's the expectations of touching someone else's life. And I'm telling you, when you can reach out and touch someone else's life, what you get from that moment moving forward is inexplicable. It, you, it It's immeasurable. It's invaluable. Come out of yourself long enough to realize that there's a world around you of people who you have the power to impact. It is when you begin to impact the lives of others that you will start to see your life truly expand. Now let's talk about uh, the power of posture and the physicality of your thoughts and how it actually applies to what we just talked about. I'm going to be real brief because I wasn't expecting to go that long on depression, but this is a time of the year that we really need to be concerned about that. We need to be concerned about it year round, but we definitely need to be concerned about people getting melancholy right now, getting caught up. There are a lot of people who are going into their first Christmas without their mother, their first Christmas without their father, their first Christmas without their child or their spouse. And, 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 and it's important that we help them make it through it. But uh, the power of posture and the physicality of your thoughts, man, no matter what book you read, whether it is As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, uh, The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Waddles, As a Man, uh, I mean, uh, Think and Grow Rich, uh, you can go on down the line of all of these books that point to the importance of your, the physicality of your thoughts. In other words, your thoughts have energy and the energy that your thoughts emit literally impact the physical world around you. Uh, this is proven now. This isn't some suggestive uh, esoteric or metaphysical idea. It's a scientific fact that your thoughts emit energy and the world around you in subatomic, uh, in its subatomic existence responds to the energy that's emitted by your thoughts. This is a reality. This has been scientifically proven. It's also been experientially proven by those who practice this um, relentlessly and ritually. They are proving that when you practice uh, protecting your thoughts, guiding your thoughts, nurturing your thoughts while guarding your mind, you produce results that are efficacious and uh, supportive and facilitative of your desires. Now, so we know that there's a physicality of thoughts. In other words, the things you're thinking actually has an impact on your reality at whatever level you're looking at life. And I'm not going to get into that because I'm trying to shorten this. Now, what we also know is that your posture can impact your emotions. Because remember, uh, I told you, I'm, I'm, I'm not exempt to having a bad day. I'm not, ex well, I am, uh, I'm not going to have a bad day. I'm going to have a bad moment. Uh, and I explain what I mean. Things happen. There's so much in this world going on where other people are involved in creating situations that you have to deal with. And because other people are involved, you don't control everything because they have the volition to do what they want. Now, you control how you respond to it, how you let it impact you, how far you're going to allow it to push you in either direction. So that's what's important. But what happens? Somebody can do something, say something, do, uh, put me in a situation that I don't want to be in. Uh, business wise, socially, family, whatever, and it's and it 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 can make me sad. It can make me angry. It can make me frustrated. Those those emotions I experience like anyone else. Here's the difference. I've got a sixty to ninety second window in which I can be in my feelings, and then I got to come out. Why? Because what I've learned is emotions are indicative mechanisms. They determine or they provide you with the information you need in a feeling sort of way that's primitive so that you recognize it immediately that something has happened. When you are happy, when you experience the emotion of happiness, it's because something in your life has happened that you desire or that you find favorable. When you're angry, that's normally an indication that someone has done something to wrong you, that someone has violated some uh, form of value of what you you hold to and now you're angry they've wronged you if you're feeling sad you've experienced loss in some kind of way you can look at your emotions and determine what it is but that's what emo emotions are emotions are indicative mechanisms they are meant to tell you of a current reality based on how you perceive life now what most of us make our mistakes is we respond to the situation through the emotion. We allow our emotions to dictate our response. So if we're angry, we normally strike out instinctively. If we're sad, we normally withdraw, fall back, 
feel defeated, and we never truly address it from where we should. We should be able to say, okay, here's this emotion. I've done it. Uh, okay, I know what's up with it. Now how I'm going to do with it. And we should be training ourselves to respond with logic, reason, and critical thought and even innovative thought. In other words, it may require a creative idea or an innovative idea to address whatever situation you're dealing with. The answer may not be readily available. So if what if the answer isn't readily available? That's when we really start to lose it most times. When we look at something and we're faced with something and we don't know what so some of us have gone through some pretty traumatic experiences over the last two or three years. Some people have I went through a very scary medical situation a year ago, a little over a year ago, October the 1st. Totally shook my life up. But what's the difference between one person who gets this crazy situation in their life medically and another person? How you perceive it. See, sometimes you're not going to have the answer immediately. It's not going to be there. What do you do? You've got to rescue yourself from your emotions. Why? Because remember, your thoughts have physicality. Uh, you can learn this in the study of psychosomatics. Psychosomatic says that whatever level of stress you have in your brain will be transmitted into your physical body. In other words, if you stress out long enough mentally, that stress will create a physical reaction in which your body will release stress-related uh, hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which serve a purpose in a short, condensed period of time to allow you to uh, do certain things. You got to remember that at the very core of the nature, the very primitive part of the brain, which is sometimes called the reptilian brain, that the, the older you go back and further you look back at the brain, at the very core, your brain is not designed for success. Your brain is not designed for you to easily move around and figure everything out of life. At the very core, your brain is survive. Your brain is designed to survive. So it, in its most instinctive manner, it's, decide, it's designed to find things that are wrong and tell you that they're there so you can respond to them. That's how you stay alive. That's how animals in the kingdom stay alive. But the more you advance in your ability to think and manage, you also discover ways to change your reality. That's the difference in being human and being any other species is that you have the capacity to literally change your reality by engaging it intellectually. But what happens is if I run into a situation that, okay, I'm looking at a situation where I was almost out of here last year. And so I'm looking up and, you know, and now I'm in a situation where the, 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 the consequences of this physical thing that's happened to me has me incapacitated. I, things that I did automatically without thinking, now I can't do it, I can't dress myself, I can't bathe myself. Now I gotta look at my wife and say, hey, can you help me do this? Can you help me do that? Something that I'm absolutely not used to. And it's easy to get caught up in the emotion of that. So what do you do? You have to rescue yourself from that emotional moment long enough to remind yourself that you have what it takes to get through it. See, sometimes it can be so, what you're going through can be so emphatic that it shakes the very core of who you are. And if you don't deal with it, then fear has a way of feeding on itself. Fear and anxiety has a way of feeding on it. The more you feed on it, the more you worry, the more you worry, the more you fear, the more you fear, the more you worry. And you're building this strong zone of stress that will now start to impact your body. So now you're feeling it, literally, not just thinking it emotionally, but feeling it physically, and it's starting to take its toll. It's starting to break you down. Adrenaline and cortisol in your body over long periods of time, which is known as chronic stress, literally destroys organs, cellular uh, uh, health, and so much, so much more. And so what you have to do is find a way to stop that. And, and long enough to remind yourself, all you got to do is stop long enough to bring yourself to a calm enough position to remind yourself, you've been through things before. This is not the first challenge that I've been through in my life. If I'm over five, I've done something I've had to go through. This is just life. Life is going to throw curves at you. That's what you do. That's how you get stronger is by standing in the box and swinging at those pitches. It's going to keep throwing them. You got to keep staying in the box. Well, anyway, what we've learned is there's a thing called embodied uh, cognition, uh, which means that your posture reflects your state of mind. Here's what's interesting. Anybody that can tell you, okay, if you're sad, if you stop in the middle of, 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 of an emotional downturn where you're feeling sad, you're feeling beat up, and you observe your, your physicality, your posture, you'll notice that your shoulders are slumped, your head is probably hung down, and uh, there are these things that physicality, you, people will be able to look at you and know 
that you're not really yourself, that you're down, that you're going through something by your physicality. Uh, it's one of the ways I observe people when I'm dealing with them. I'm looking at their mannerisms, I'm looking at their physicality, and I can tell what state they're in. And, and, and the thing is, here, here, here's the key though, as much as I can de determine where you're at emotionally by observing your posture, I can also change where you're at emotionally by changing your posture. There is actually scientific support behind something very common that we use, a, 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 an adage we use very commonly, or uh, a statement of encouragement we use it uh, very commonly, but it's actually scientific fact behind it. We, how many times have you been somewhere and you're just not really feeling that life is kind of kicking your butt and somebody say, hold your head up, keep your head up. And you know what that means to you. That means, hey, man, just keep going. It's going to be all right. Don't get discouraged. But actually, when you physically raise your head, when you stop your head from hanging and you raise your head up, it automatically leads to a second physiological response, which is your shoulders start to square. It's because your body has been trained uh, neurologically to respond to certain situations. So when you raise your head, it immediately sends a message, a neuro neurological signal to your brain that you're in this posture. And your brain immediately, in a matter of milliseconds, associates the posture with a feeling. And in that, you're gonna find that you can't hold your head up for any, you can't hold your head up for 10 seconds and your shoulders square and not alleviate some of the things that are holding you down. That's how quick you can rescue yourself, by simply holding your head up. And see, the thing is, holding your head up and squaring your shoulders doesn't require you for you to even believe that anything, right? All it does is says, I'm going to forcefully make myself hold my head up and square my shoulders. I'm going to immediately rescue myself out of a situation using embodied, embodied cognition. It's just, so not only does your posture reflect your current emotional state, it has the power to change it. It's one of the quickest ways to rescue yourself from a moment long enough to get your bearings. That's why people say, hold your head up. Whether they knew why holding your head up made you feel better, they knew that it did, and they would tell you to hold your head up. Then it became somewhat of a symbolic gesture, a symbolic statement, and people lost the sight of what it really does. But when somebody tells you to hold your head up, hold it up. When somebody says, square your shoulders, we take it again as something figurative. But no, it's physical. Square your shoulders, sit up straight, hold your head up, and find out how difficult it is to feel defeated in that position. How difficult is it to feel helpless in that position? The moment you square your shoulders, it immediately sends a message to your brain that you got this. You don't have to know how you've got it. You just got to know you've got it. You figure out the rest later. Uh, I, I tell people all the time. Providence comes after commitment. The decision to make something happen in your life comes before you know how you're going to get it done. Because a lot of times, what you need to make it happen is not readily available in your life. You haven't become that yet. You haven't learned that yet. You haven't mastered that yet. You haven't obtained that. You haven't met that person yet. Whatever the situation is, isn't there yet. But once you make a commitment to it, providence moves. See, that's what faith is. Faith is the commitment to something that evidence has not proven to you is possible, but you believe it is. You know it is. That so much so that you've committed to making it happen without knowing how. It is after you make the commitment that providence moves. It is after you make the commitment that you will find that things you never thought possible begin to happen and you can't explain it. Have you ever been in a situation where you see a person over and over again, like I used to do a satellite office in, in uh, Starbucks a lot, especially when I was still in Dallas. I used to do uh, Starbucks. Now I work pretty much at the office in the house, but uh, I still go up there occasionally because I interact with people and it's a good way uh, to just really keep myself focused and keep from going stir crazy. But that was a time I was always in there and it would be people that would pass by me all the time and I nod at them or speak, you know, courteous and see them every day and now give them a second thought. They speak to me, keep going. And then I will get to a point to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. This is my next 90 days. This is how I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. And then all of a sudden that person stops by the table and goes, hey man, I know that you're always sitting here. And I was just kind of wondering what it is that you do. And then I started talking about it. I said, oh man, I know this guy. And here you go. 
And this happens over and over in life that people that are right in front of you sometimes, but because you haven't made the commitment, you haven't told your subconscious mind what it is you want. It's not going to identify what it is you need in that person that even it knows is there. That is something. There's something inside of us. If you haven't read the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, you've got to read that book. It talks about the natural intuition of human beings to be able to be. Uh, to detect and sense things in in, 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 in fractions of seconds, and and and, uh, the, and what it what it what what it goes into and talks about is they did these series of tests in which they exposed people to other people, other situations, couples sitting at tables, professors lecturing, all these different people, and and they 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 exposed them in varying degrees. Some people got to sit in the lecture. Uh, for the entire time. Some people got to hear the lecture on a tape. Others got to watch them through a window but couldn't hear it. Others, you know, were just exposed to it for a matter of seconds. And this happened over very different situations. And what they found is the people who were exposed the least amount of time and had to depend on their intuition to make a detection about the specifics of a person or a situation were actually more accurate than the per people who were exposed to it the longest. In other words, the more we exposed to something, the more we try to rationalize it, reason it, measure it. That's why you got a bunch of women who checked off all these boxes on this checklist of what they want from a man having all of these issues with the man because at the beginning, that was this intuition that something was how many times have you heard when I first met him, I didn't like him, but he checked off all the boxes, six figure income, nice car, nice clothes, very, very hospitable, very um, chivalrous, all these things only to find out later he's a cheater. That thing you felt at the beginning was telling you he was a cheater. He wasn't right, but you ignored it because we've been trained to believe we're smarter than life. We don't use the gifts that we have. We don't use the int intuition given to us by the creator uh, to, to function and operate in any way. We like to be told, we like to figure we got it all figured out. But anyway, the power of posture. There are people that go through life so and, and, be, and become successful solely on being able to embrace life through posture that directs their emotional state. Your emotional state is going to determine how you perceive things. If you're always in a down state, everything you see is you're going to see it from the dark side. You ever seen people? I say this all the time. You got people, if, they're, if they have a proclivity towards anger, they are going to find something to be angry about. I don't care what the situation is. If you got a person who's upbeat, they will find a way to find something that's worth being happy about. Same thing with someone who is sad. That's why you've got to learn and develop to develop this state a mind, um, I call it an optimal state. And I've heard other people call it a bunch of state, beautiful state. Uh, uh, I mean, just different, different, different uh, ways of referring to being in a holistic e equilibrium where your mind, your body, your emotions, your spirit and soul are all in oneness in that you're functioning at this level where you expect things to happen because Life will only deliver to you what you expect from it. God will only deliver to you what you expect from it. The universe will only deliver to you what you expect from it. Whatever you're expecting out of life is what you're going to get. You never achieve or receive anything beyond or above what you expect out of life. So if you want to change what you're getting, you have to change your expectations. You have to raise your standards. You have to raise what you're looking for and demanding out of life. And it starts with you. But again, look at your posture. Examine your posture and determine you're going to use your posture to your benefit. Now, this isn't an escape from reality. This is a way to measure yourself because the thing, of the, uh, the thing is this. Life is going to happen no matter how you view it, no matter what you go through. Life is going to happen at some point in time. Life's going to kick you in the head. Life's going to knock you down. Life is going to treat you like crap. And you're going to go through it. It's just a part of the growing process. But how you perceive what happens is going to set your state. If you are a person that's saying, yeah, man, nothing ever happens right for me, then you're going to find yourself on this downward spiral. If you're a person that sits up and you look, uh, uh, and I've said this, I've shared this with you before. Um, Quincy Jones uh, recently, within the last couple of years, uh, was at an event where um, Jim Quick was at, which is this guy that's a master at teaching people how to remember stuff. 
and he's at this seminar and Jim Quick calls him up and he asks, you know, Quincy, you know, with everything you've accomplished in your life, and Quincy's like 80 some years old, he asks him with everything you've accomplished in your life, with all the things you had to go through, with all the problems you faced, how did you get through it? And Quincy's response was, I don't have problems. And Jim's like, come on, everybody has problems. It's just how you, he says, no, I don't have problems, I have puzzles. Now, he has the same situations in his life that everybody that has come from his background and, 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 and gone through what he's gone through has experienced. So what does he say? The reason he's able to do what he's able to do is because it's how he's perceived it. He doesn't see his problems as problems. He sees them as puzzles. Why is that important? Because puzzles are meant to be solved. So every time he encounters something that's challenging, that seems like an obstacle, that's moving against him, that is in his way, he knows it can be solved because it's not a problem. It's a puzzle. And that's called perception. Perception creates your reality. However you view it is how it will be because your mind is more powerful than anything in the universe. If you perceive it to be a problem, it is a problem. If you perceive it to be a challenge, it's a challenge. If you perceive it to be an opportunity, it's an opportunity. It's what your mind perceives it to be. Am I sitting up saying you just think it? No, I'm not a positive thinker. Everything's going to be all right type guy. I'm a, I'm a positive thinker sets the stage for you to take appropriate action type of guy. In other words, you can think positive all you want to. If you sit there and think life just going to come bring you everything you want because you're being positive, that's not going to happen. But when you associate action with a positive mindset that sets a state of expectation of positive things, the energy level that you fun function on creates a frequency that creates a vibration that releases an energy that can only resonate or attract other like energy. And so you've got to learn what's on different energy levels, what's on frequencies. The lower frequencies are all your negative stuff, anger, bitterness, lack, hostility, disharmony, all of these things that bring nothing but poor health, poor state of mind, poor relationships, all of these things are functioning on these low frequencies. The more you're able to raise your frequency, the first of all, the more you're able to raise your frequency, the more healthier you'll become. Because in addition to nutrition, your state of mind is the most powerful influence over your physical health. If you're if 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 you if you're having problems controlling your mental state, you're going to have problems controlling your physical health, even when you're eating proper and, and, and eating in uh, a proper and, and uh, a supported nutritional way. Uh, it's going to happen because that's the power of the mind. That is absolutely no more powerful of a force on this planet than your mind. You're literally creating realities with every thought because you're planting the seeds of what will, what, what will eventually come to harvest in the future each and every second of the day. You don't get some some consequences have short gestation periods, meaning that you can plant it and you'll get a consequence immediately. You walk out and spit on the wrong person. That seed you just planted that came from a thought that ended up in an action is going to produce a rather rapid response. But if you sit up and say, you know what, I'm going to become a better person so I'll attract a better mate. That may require years of a gestational period from that thought where you are literally attracting the nutrients in the ground of your reality, which means you're growing as a person, you're growing in responsibility, you're growing in the ability to listen because you can't have a relationship if you don't listen, if you don't take the time to try to understand whoever you're in a relationship with. All of these things will require time. And what I've learned from the universe is that when you're really truly making yourself one with the universe, when you're operating at this optimal state, the universe will never deliver something to you that is good until you are prepared to receive it. It will literally protect you from yourself when you are operating in oneness. And so a lot of things that you're planting seeds for, you're getting frustrated from, you haven't given the seed the full time it needs to gestate. There's nothing you can go out and plant in your yard right now that you're going to walk out there in the morning. Not too much anything of any real value that you can walk out there in the morning and you can see the fruit of your labor. It takes time. Every seed has a different gestation period. And that gestation period will be impacted by a number of different variables. What type of ground did you plant it in? What type of environment did you plant it in? What season did you plant it in? All of these different things are going to come in and impact how well that seed and how rapid that seed gestates. So the one thing that you can't do is plant a seed that's 
look, you're looking to produce a certain reality and then measure how long it's taking your seed to gestate against someone else's. Why? Because you can't be totally aware of their entire reality that allowed their seed to gestate in just five months and it's taking you eight. You don't measure yourself against that. You measure yourself against your energy. You measure yourself against what you're doing in potential. You measure yourself in what you're doing and how you're feeling about what you're accomplishing. If you can look at yourself every day and you can see progress in your life moving towards this goal that you consider to be worthy, then you are successful. You are progressing. You are growing. You are moving. You are healing. All of these things that are necessary to reach this optimal state of functionality in life requires you to grow constantly. You're never there. You're always growing. Even when you hit that goal, you just hit something that you, that's there really just to tell you you're still growing. Now you got to set another goal to go out there and grow some more. That's what life is about, growing so you increase your impact and capacity to impact and influence others in a positive way. If you grow without the understanding or if you go after things, the outcome, which I call the outcome of the result, the result, without actually setting up an idea of what you're going to do when you get it to help others, you will always miss it. You, you will hit some goals. You will achieve a certain level of success because the grind principle alone tells me if I put in the work and I push myself and I don't quit, there are just certain things I'm going to get. But if you don't do it with the intent on making the world around you better, you will find that you are not fully fulfilled. Been there. Well, you wake up every morning and it seems like you got everything you want, but you're still miserable and you can't find it. So you start looking for it in things that you think will fulfill it, like women, like men, like, like uh, material things, like traveling, whatever it is that the world tells you, if you get this, you'll be great. And none of it makes you feel better. Why? Because you were put here for a bigger purpose than to fulfill all your desires. You get your desires by living in your purpose. When you put your purpose first, when you get ready to go out and touch lives, change lives, feel lives, make people feel better. Sometimes it's not done on a grand stage with a hundred thousand people sitting in front of you. Sometimes it's this one person that's sitting across from you at the coffee shop, sitting next to you on the bus, whatever it is, and they're going through something and you can be aware of it, that something's not right. And you turn around and touch their life. You've impacted a world, especially if you touch their lives right, because they'll take that energy you poured into them and they'll take it and go pour it into somebody else. You'll look up and you've touched a hundred people by touching one. Remember, I talk about that all the time. Infect people people more than, just, more than just affect them. Infect them with your passion. Infect them with your expectations. Expe it, 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 it infect them with, with, with a desire to help. Infect them with a belief that anything is possible. Infect them. And when you infect someone, you create a contagion. That contagion means that when they touch something else, it'll be passed on to that thing they touch. And so you send them out, having infected them with an expectation of a higher level of existence, and they touch other people. Before you look up, you've touched people that you will never, ever meet in your life. That's what you should be striving for. All of this other stuff will fall in line and come to you automatically when you're living at the height and the level of your design. With that being said, I'm going to close out once again with this reminder. This is a very tough time for a lot of people. Uh, the holiday seasons uh, can produce uh, a lot of melancholy feelings. It can produce depression. It can pr produce frustrating situations. Um, a lot of people going through, like I said, this Christmas, this is uh, the first Christmas after a divorce. This is the first Christ Christmas after losing a maid, a parent, a friend, or whatever. Um, sometimes they're reminded of things that are happened way back. You don't know what people are going through, but what you can do is care. It starts with caring. When you really, truly care, you don't have to have the answer. You just have to be good enough at convincing convincing people that an answer exists and provide them with options. No one is going to be sitting there and decide, de choose death when they know there are options. Death is that point that people get to when they decide to take their lives. And we're saying this because uh, those who are, are tuning in after the beginning of the show and, and won't go back and watch the whole thing, we're talking about this because over the past week we've had three children kill themselves, two here in Houston. Uh, from Paraland and another little girl, I'm not sure where, a 10 year old girl who was being uh, bullied, uh, hung herself. And, 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 it, and it's not just our youth. Uh, black women are very prone to depression at this time of the year. And we have a tendency to place so much on the backs of our women and demand so much of them. And I was telling my wife before, something my 
uh, grandmother told me a long time ago, probably the strongest woman, and my wife reminds me so much of her, and I think that's why we, we are where we're at right now, is that she said, being strong sometimes is a curse because nobody thinks you need them. So don't think it's just the person you perceive to be weak that needs you right now. Sometimes it's the people you're looking at and you just automatically assume, oh, they got it. They don't need me because they made it through this, this, and You don't know when a person is at their breaking point. And if you have the ability, you've got, if you have the ability to touch their lives, touch it. Don't assume that they got it. Say, okay, even if you've got it, let me help you so you don't have to put everything into it. Let, let me help you. Let someone know that they are not alone. Remove that emptiness. Care about people. I can't stress that enough. Care about people. The things that you don't give attention to have magnitude with other people. And be, be transparent with how your life has transpired. Don't just paint a portrait of all of this success without talking about some of the dark moments because that makes the connection for people who are not yet arrived where you're at. That gives them a hope. Well, if they made, if he made it, if she made it, then I can make it. And that's what this is about is saying, hey, I've, I've made a little progress. Let me show you how. And, 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 and then also, if you happen to be somebody that's going through something, there are no points given for for, 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 for playing strong and not asking for help and not saying, man, this is a tough one. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. There, you, you don't get points for that in life. Sometimes the strongest person needs help. And you've got to be willing to allow yourself to need help because just the idea that you shouldn't need help, but you need it might be the thing that pushes you over the edge. Give yourself permission to need somebody. And then convince yourself to find somebody you can depend on. And there are people out there. There are people out there that are experts at what they do. There are people out there that just are gifted at what they do. Uh, there are people out there that will, will, will gladly listen to you and be able to talk to you and point you in the right direction. And if you can't find anybody, email me at lifechange at rickwallacephd.link and I will find and connect you with somebody that is an expert in whatever you're dealing with. I will make that my personal commitment. I don't want you out there thinking you're going through something and there's absolutely no one to turn with. There's nothing you're going through that somebody hasn't gone through already. And there are answers to whatever dilemmas you're facing, but you've got to bring yourself in and prepare yourself to be helped and to prepare yourself to expect something good to come out of where you're at right now. And when you do that, things will automatically change. I absolutely adore and love you guys. It is an honor to be able to share with you. Uh, and I understand that time is of the essence. And so the time that you give to these lengthy uh, videos, we're pushing up on almost an hour now, 52 minutes, 52 and a half minutes. So probably somewhere around 53 minutes by the time I get off of here. But what I can tell you is it's an honor to do it, and I hope that in some way I'm encouraging or empowering people to take a more uh, engaged uh, approach to dealing with their life. Stop waiting on things to happen. Start influencing things. Life is not happening to you. It's responding to you. Learn how to engage that. As I always say, I'm going to die on E, and I encourage you to do the same thing. That's the only way to truly live life. Live it on full so that you don't eat having left nothing on the table undone. With that being said, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day, an unbelievable week, and I'll get back as soon as I possibly can. I'm out. Peace. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement. For those who have followed me for any stretch of time, you know outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group. I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage 
uh, initiative and restoring ghetto for ghettos forgotten daughters which is a program focused on helping young girls but boys as well suffering from childhood sexual abuse uh, rape molestation domestic abuse uh, absentee fatherhood and so many other things uh, the information will be in the box thank you Conceptual, yeah, so, uh, people talk Real about talk, it, I ain't throwing shots. all of the elements.